All right. It says we are live on YouTube. I'm going to wait for a show of hands from our viewers to determine whether or not we actually are live. Um, let us know. I can see <gasps> Identity 4 telling us it is live. So that is great. Good to know. So let us begin the show in three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 736, recorded on Wednesday, August 28th, 2019. Hot nudie science! Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with sleep, airports, and puzzles. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. It started a long, long time ago in a galaxy much closer than you might think. The one you are in and on the outskirts of. In fact, uh, it was just a spark. Or maybe it was a muddy blob at the bottom of an ocean. A simple interaction of the right combination of chemicals. However it began, life has come a long way since then. With domains and kingdoms, phylums and classes, families and genuses, species of all sorts. Life diversified in a brilliantly mind-blowing explosion of possibilities. So much so so abundantly so that it may be easy to forget that it is truly unique compared to what we have seen thus far of the rest of the universe. Out of all of those possibilities, out of the seemingly endless diversity of living things on Earth, you happen to be one of them and a human being thing at that. With a keen brain and a modest ability to communicate. And of all the places you could have been in this amazing world, world full of life, you chose to be here. And we are so happy you are because you are in for another episode of This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go. to you kiki and blair and a good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode of this week in science we are back again to fill your heads with all the science news that we thought was really interesting this week we found all sorts of fun stuff as we love to do this week while there are fires burning in the Amazon and, you know, we're hoping that people will jump to the rescue there. We've got science that we can talk about in the meantime. Find ways to find hope in this earth of ours. I have stories about sleep, right? Sleep's good. Gives me hope for the future. Our planet and computers. And we also have an interview this evening with scientist and science communicator Dr. Rochelle Tanner coming up in just a few moments. Justin, what do you have for us tonight? Uh, so far, I have a, a Toxoplasma Gondii story, and that's about it. But uh, there might be something else by the end of the show. Something else. You might pick something plenty else up. Okay, plenty of time to put something together. Just you go search for your stories right now. All right, Blair, what is in the animal corner? Oh, my goodness. I have deaf birds, I have smart birds, and I have migrations. Migrations. I love migrations. Mm -hmm. Migrations going places we like to go okay well let's get on with the show that's what i like to do it's a migration from the beginning to the end of the science stories as we jump in i want to remind everyone that you can subscribe to the twist podcast if you have not yet done so you can find us all places that podcasts are found the normal places itunes google play podcast portal and on Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify, Pandora, Radio.com, tune in. Oh my goodness, so many things. You can also find us on YouTube. We're on Facebook. Look for This Week in Science. But to start to find information, twisttwis.org is one of the easiest things to remember. Now, let's jump into this interview. 
I would love to introduce our guest tonight, Dr. Rochelle Tanner. She is a climate ecophysiologist at Washington State University. She communicates about science and climate change and is a member of the Governing Council of the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, or NOKI. And that is nothing to do with Italian potato pasta. Welcome to the show, Dr. Tanner. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. We're so glad to have you on. Um, I know that we've met briefly in the, in the in, within the last year, and Blair works with you through the Noki Network. But it's about time we brought you in to the Twist Show so that we could uh, talk with you and about the work that you do so that our audience can know more about you. So to get started, what is a climate ecophysiologist? Well, um... I like to break it down by all the parts of the word. So ecophysiologist just is ecology and physiology shoved together as one word because we can't be bothered to say more than one, I guess. Um, and it's basically looking at how the environment is changing how the body works. It's pretty simple. And when you add in climate change, uh, it's just kind of understanding how changes in our environment that are human induced can change how the body works in lots of animals and plants. And what do you specifically study with relation to this field of study? Uh, well, in terms of animals, I think mm -hmm. you guys know that I work on nudibranchs um, and sea hares, but right now I work on mussels, uh, which are the kind you eat, the kind you find in the supermarket. Um, so broadly, all of those animals are mollusks. Right, all in that, that the family, the mollusca family. Right. Why, why are they interesting to look at? Why did you go from the nudibranchs and the sea hares to mollusks? What is the thing that ties them all together? Well, I like to think of them as kind of the superheroes of our seas. So a lot of them live in these really extreme environments that we think are um, just having these really big shifts in climate, even in our current climate. So uh, because they can deal with these really huge shifts in uh, environmental fluctuations, like temperature and how salty the water is, uh, we think that they can help us understand how we will see a future in our environment and how we can start to adapt. Well, for us, I mean, adaptation, I'm just going to go to the store and buy some, you know, some some raincoats for where I live up here in Portland. Other people might work on their air conditioning, but mm -hmm. animals have to adapt in different ways. So right. um, when we're when we're thinking about it in terms to bring it to the, the point of climate change, um, what are we really concerned about with these? These creatures live in the ocean and, you know, the, the water gets warm and it gets cooler, but it's pretty moderated, moderated. I mean, when we think of the ocean and we think of that moderate temperature mm -hmm. that doesn't change too much. Yeah. So that is something that is kind of a common misconception. The open ocean is actually really, uh, maybe moderate compared to the things that we experience on land. But when you think of organisms that live near the shore, uh, which most of the things that I study do, they live at this intersection between land and sea. And so not only do they experience those really cold temperatures if you live near the Pacific Ocean, uh, they also experience the really hot air temperatures. And so they're going from like 40 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the span of a few hours every day. That's like an astronaut on the moon going from like <laughs> going from like night to day on the moon. They're going hundreds of degrees. But um, so what allows these animals to be able to withstand such temperature differences over the course of a day? There's actually a lot of different ways that animals deal with this. Um, the ones that can move even just a little bit by shifting their posture, they can do behavioral regulation of their temperature. Mm -hmm. um, these nudibranchs can't do that. They move incredibly slow. So all they have to protect them is their cellular response. So what's happening on below the levels of organization that you can see on the surface. And so what they have is these things called heat shock proteins that go around in their cells and find 
proteins that have been mangled by the effects of temperature and they bring them in to the heat shock protein and they refold them and then spit them back out. And so if you have lots of heat shock proteins, you can withstand more um, temperature, high temperature effects. And we have these proteins too. So this is mm -hmm. something that we have in common with these, with these organisms. What I'm, I'm really finding it really striking how you mentioned the difference between the behavioral modification. So like, you know, I can go inside into air conditioning or go under, under a shade, a shaded area, but there's this cellular adaptation that takes place, this ability that, that the cells themselves and I mean, I'm just I'm just thinking of this as these these animals that are cellularly manipulating themselves. These it, it's this organismal response. It's like the it's I mean, if you had a plate, a dish of cells of bacteria that had to respond, it's pretty much a similar a similar state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the important thing to remember there is that they're not always expressing these proteins that do all of this really important stuff, because if you think about it, if you had to, um, you know, generate lots of really expensive uh, functions, like if you were always running all the time, breathing really hard when you didn't have to be, it's probably not great. And so they have this thing called plasticity where they're able to change their expression based on what they experience in their environment, either right then or a couple days, hours, weeks before to try and you know, cut down on the cost that their body has um, producing these proteins. Wait, weeks before. Yeah. yeah. So, so they also wait. Are they predicting the weather? Is this is this what we should instead of the the you know six o'clock news for the week's weather, we should be cutting open mollusks to ask a new brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so they they kind of have this understanding of regular fluctuations in our environment, right? Just like we know what seasons are and, you know, we're in summer right now and we know that it's going to cool down uh, based on how long their lifespan is. They can do the same thing. And that's why climate change, it can be really important to understand how climate change is going to affect them because we're going to have different kinds of shifts in our future that they are not used to seeing. So their predictions of the past and the future are going to be wrong. Which and so how did, how did their responses impact kind of other animals in the intertidal or how, how can our studying them help inform uh, what we know about other species? So some nudibranchs can be keystone species, which mean that they play a really important role in our ecosystem, whether that be um, they die when there's an El Nino event, um, which they actually do the opposite of that, or um, something really important eats them. Uh, that's kind of what a keystone species would be. Um, and uh, so in that respect, we can kind of use them as an indicator of how how well we're doing um, for everyone else in the food chain. But on a more uh, like biology theory level, understanding how the heat shock proteins work um, just across all of these species can give us a lot of information on what we can look for for resilience in other species. Yeah, it's like looking for clues. We know <laughs> there's relation. We have these mm -hmm. proteins in common and we have these little threads. So are there are there things, clues that we can use to find out who's going to do well and who's not? Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to, you, you recently published a paper on nudibranchs and their plasticity and ability to withstand these changes in temperature. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you found and um, what, what its implications are. So uh, I guess I'll preface this by saying that this project was not something that we really set out to do. It was just kind of a fun weekend ex exploration of the coast. And we saw all of these nudibranchs popping up. And so we decided to look at which ones were doing the best. Um, and to kind of to understand why we were seeing so many. And uh, one of the ones that popped up in the news everywhere, I don't know if you remember, I think it was in 2016, the Hopkins Rose Nudibrank, which was this bright pink, puffy pom-pom looking thing. And everyone wanted to know why it was there. And 
we actually found that that species has really high tolerance for temperature. They can get up to 95 degrees Fahrenheit for a pretty substantial amount of time and still recover from that. But the really interesting thing that we saw was that um, when you raise the average temperature of their environment, so if you simulate kind of what climate change will look like, they drastically lose this ability. Um, so they have a trade-off between how well they're able to manipulate their um, uh, upper critical limits, so how hot they can get, and uh, their plasticity. And so this paper was kind of a really great example of this principle uh, in biology called the trade-off hypothesis, which is exactly that. There's a trade-off between the upper limit and how well you can manipulate that upper limit. And so this was kind of surprising, right? Like you would expect that the individuals that are used to hotter temperatures would do better in a climate change scenario, right? Right, right. And so it, we're thinking that it might have to do with some sort of energy trade-off. So as a physiologist, we always think about how we use our energy, um, how, how it gets partitioned in different uh, aspects of our physiology, right? You could try and use all of it to run as fast as you can, or you can try and use all of it to run as long as you can. And that's kind of the same principle that's happening here. Ooh, Kiki's muted. Kiki, we can't hear you. <laughs> Still can't hear you. Yeah. Okay, I'm back now. Oh, okay. I'm trying, I'm, there's a lot of buttons to push over here these days. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm really fascinated also by this by this trade off and what it means for which species are going to do well and which are not. And um, you know, in the eco ecology world, there's also these trade offs between generalists and specialists, and mm -hmm. there's the concern that specialists will not do as well in climate change because say their their food species will disappear or particular uh, aspects of their niche will not be available to them any longer. Um, and so in thinking about this trade-off with the, uh, the tolerances with how plastic they are versus how high they can go, um, there was, you also found this in, a, in another study that was published with mussels as well. So you're not just finding it in this one species of nudibranch, you're finding this kind of across different species within this whole family. Right, and it's actually outside of this family too. Uh, the whole theory, theoretical framework was proposed by my PhD advisor in 2002 um, in crabs, porcelain crabs. And so it's really being seen in a lot of different species, but we're also seeing the opposite in a lot of species, like in diving beetles. Uh, if they have higher tolerance, they also have higher plasticity. But the thinking behind the trade-off hypothesis is that it all has to do with energy, right? And so you don't have an unlimited amount of energy to just keep increasing your tolerance and your plasticity. It has to stop somewhere. And so um, we're actually writing a paper right now, it should be, in press in the next few weeks on awesome. melding that idea of the specialist generalists um, and the trade-off hypothesis, kind of thinking about an overall framework for energy allocation under these like really variable climate scenarios. And would the, I mean, when we're thinking about the energy that they're expending to tolerate these higher temperatures, what is that going into? Where, I mean, they don't have to sweat so you know, what, is, what is the actual energy expenditure that's occurring? Do we know that? Well, I mean, making proteins takes energy and transcribing um, RNA, which makes the proteins, takes energy. It all does. And so being able to mount a response and do it quickly is really energetically expensive. And then there's also there's got to be a, sort of a trade-off. If you're, if you're making this protein, you're not making something else. Right. Yeah. Or you're making less of it. You're, yeah, you're you're using uh, you're using basically the same machinery and pathways to get these proteins out, which means something else isn't getting expressed as much. And did you need it? And if you did, and now, but you're just having to fight the heat. You're, you're, you're that's a whole other series of trade offs that are going on. Yeah, a really tangible example of that is that these organisms that are constantly stressed and expressing all of these 
uh, stress proteins, they aren't able to reproduce. And so that kind of limits the population success in the future. Wow. So this is also, this is just all feeding back. It's like, hey, I'm more tolerant and I can survive a little bit more. But if this change happens more, then I'm going to die. But even beyond that, I'm not having any kids either. No, right. there's no time. I'm too busy <laughs> being successful at not dying. Right. You have to stop and reproduce. Yeah, which kind of leads me to my next question, which is a lot of these animals, like uh, mussels are pretty sessile. They can't really move around, right? The nudibranchs, a lot of these guys are in tide pools, really hard to get from one tide pool to another. So um, what kind of hope can we have? What expectation can we have for adaptation or um, or kind of movement for these species to be able to make it through this really rapid change? So uh, I'll take mussels as an example. It's a little yeah. bit easier because they're broadcast spawners. So that means that they their babies don't live necessarily where they live. And so they put out all of their gametes um, into the open ocean where it's not very stressful. And so you have um, lots and lots of babies out there and then they come back to settle and they come back along the entire coast. And so there's a lot of chance, uh, they call it like sweepstakes um, recruitment. There's a lot of chances for them to make it to a place where they can survive and in a different range. Um, and in terms of having hope about this, even though we're finding these trade-offs, they are still well above where we expect to see climate change affecting these populations. And so we kind of have to walk the line between making sure that our audience uh, understands that there's urgency in this problem, but also knowing that there are species that are going to be okay. And in terms of that, uh, I, all of these studies, that what you're finding, is this is, is the goal it's it, not just to understand it scientifically, but also be able to make recommendations to field ecologists, to conservationists, to people who are working in, you know, either, not either conservation or in the climate change or ocean um, ocean environments. Yeah, I have gotten really interested in restoration ecology in the past few years, and that's kind of the idea of. Uh, you know, using what we have in the current biodiversity, knowing which ones are going to be successful and kind of building our ecosystems around those. And yeah, I think that's a major uh, thing that we strive for, but it can be really difficult to link physiology because it can be so abstract, especially at the gene and protein level to management strategies. And so we're just trying to still work on that multidisciplinary link. Yeah, you're going, you're going from gene and protein to individual organisms and then populations. And, you know, so it's drawing that, drawing that line between all of those things to be able to get to the point where you can have strategies for restoration, right? Yeah. But it's, I, I mean, it's all about reducing stress, right? So like, I think about <laughs> so in many things in the, life. <laughs> well, and I mean, stress, not like, oh my God, I'm so stressed out. But like, you know, in fact, in stress factors, right? Because you were talking about trade-offs. And in climate change all the time, we talk about individual animals that are, or ecosystems or populations that are responding to one very slight change in climate or in um, pH of the ocean, for example, because there's all these other things happening to these um, these populations. So if we can reduce one stressor in the form of giving them more space or shelter, then potentially, right, there's an opportunity that they can respond better to climate changes. Yeah, and I think this is kind of even deeper in the weeds, but what's happening in some restoration fields is thinking about how we can kind of help existing populations by bringing in individuals from other populations that are more resilient. They have this gene expression that we know is successful under um, future conditions. So they're actually doing this um, in some coral reefs in Indonesia and the Great Barrier Reef. They're starting to look at how we can bring in resilient corals from other areas to kind of help the corals in that area broaden their genetic diversity to, you know, deal with a bleaching event. So it's invasive species with a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> they call it managed relocation. It is yeah. a very yeah. 
very uh, hot topic, highly debated whether that is uh, useful. <laughs> yeah, you got to watch the I word, right? Invasive. Yes. <laughs> like I mean, a dirty yeah. word. We, we we take animals all over the place sometimes because we want them to be there so that we can, you know, raise them and eat them sometimes because we want them to outcompete some pest species that we don't want to be there anymore. And now because we want them to help out ecosystems at the genetic level, which mm -hmm. I find fascinating mm -hmm. that yeah. this is getting to that that whole thing of like, well, it's all... In the end, it, it kind of all comes down to genes anyway. And if you put the species together and they can breed, then maybe that's a good idea. Yeah, some of these, they're not even moving species. It's just populations that they're moving mm -hmm. around. Um, mm -hmm. Some people are all about using CRISPR instead and actually editing the genes. Uh, but I think we are quite a far ways away from that right now. Yeah. I think we're really, we're very, very far away from that right now. But I probably have read sci-fi stories about this, you know, entire worlds that have been genetically created. <laughs> that would um, be so much work. <laughs> you know, yeah. just, 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 be a take, lot. just take life that's from another planet and, and see if they, you could set it down somewhere that's kind of similar and they'll find a niche eventually. Right? It, you don't have to engineer it that, that well. You would think so. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this gets to the kind of, you know, we are always as humans manipulating our environment. We are the master engineers aside from uh, beavers, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we we are in the process. We have been manipulating the planet and it has caused climate change. We have anthropogenic climate change ongoing right now. People are coming up with engineering solutions for that as well. But, um, you know, where where do you fall in the discussion of, you know, we what steps we should be taking when you look at the populations that you're studying and you're seeing the threat to particular ecosystems, to populations? Where, where does that put you when you start looking at the planet and what we have done to it? Well, I think uh, a lot of people think that scientists shouldn't have a view on this because it's sometimes seen as political, but I think we just have a responsibility to manage the world that we live in. So, I mean, a lot of the things that I study are going to be okay and Resilience is a huge theme of my research. And so in that way, I like to inject a lot of hope into my messages. And hopefully along with that hope, I can encourage people who are either reading my papers or listening to my outreach talks that we need to take action as a community. And it's really not that hard. So um, I try and lead by example but it can be difficult when we're going to conferences around the world. And so scientists are trying to look at carbon zero conferences, which is a really interesting new idea on how we would meet as a community and also uphold these values that we hold um, in terms of combating climate change. Um, and then we also all just try and be a little more cognizant of how our research is impacting our community. And we wanna make sure that we bring everyone in so that everyone understands their role in the whole situation and not just us telling them that things are going to be bad. And so that's kind of the approach I take, even though there are definitely more active ones that I could be taking, right? Like um, promoting civic action, um, all of these great things that Noki does. It's not something that I feel is where my best effort is spent. So I kind of wanted to ask about that, too, uh, because, I mean, listeners to the show that have heard me wax on and on about Noki before know how I'm connected. And it's a it's a no brainer because I work in environmental education and conservation education. Of course, I'm going to care about climate change communication strategies. So um, one of the reasons I have loved working with you in the Noki network is that you are this kind of um, voice for. Uh, the research side of things and the scientific community, which are part a really important part of Noki. But I'm just kind of curious how you became interested and now how you're using um, social strategies for climate communication in your work. 
since, as you said, a lot of that is focused on kind of, you know, the research side of things, how do you use that? Yeah. So how did I find Noki and yeah. why am I still using it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think being a scientist, first and foremost, is uh, you don't have any impact unless you're able to communicate your work. And I think that's been lost recently or not recently, really just like throughout um, science becoming sequestered in this ivory tower. And so I really wanted to understand how I could communicate my science, especially uh, because I work in climate science, um, knowing and from experience, knowing that people are kind of hostile about that topic, how I could be approaching it in a better way to kind of have a more productive and honestly an easier discussion in a lot of my outreach talks. Um, and the way that I use it right now is uh, kind of more on the meta scale. I don't talk a lot to the public. I don't do this sort of thing very often, but I do come into contact with a lot of scientists who are talking to the public or who have the same level of engagement that I do. And as a bigger community of scientists, we can have a really big impact. And so if I can bring more of my community into the Noki community, that's what I consider a success in my involvement. Nice. Yeah. It's kind of having that, having that trickle down effect of the information coming from you and potentially leading out to other people who will then have the information lead to other people and right. the network grows. It's a, I guess a hub and, hub and spoke kind of model. Yeah. <laughs> Which is awesome. Um, we've, we've touched on the, the heavy climate change and we've touched on your science. Now I would love to know what is your favorite mollusk? What like what got you into the mollusks in the first place? Your sea hairs. Tell us, tell us about your passion for that stuff. So I uh, saw my first nudibranch in high school, and it was one of the ugliest nudibranchs out there. It's called the shaggy mouse nudibranch because it looks like a dead rat when it's out of the water, like a wet dead rat. But for some reason, immediately I really wanted to study these animals. And uh, I did my undergrad, not really in biology, um, but still knew that I was going to go to grad school and try and think about uh, nudibranchs. And when I found my advisor at Berkeley, um, we kind of came up with this idea about sea hares, because uh, there were lots of them in his lab, and no one was studying them. And I was really passionate about climate change already, because my undergrad was in environmental studies, environmental policy influencing our nation's decisions around their oceans. And so I kind of brought these two things together and that's why I study mollusks and climate change, but it really started with that one that looks like a dead rat. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> I really like dead rats. Hey, <laughs> it's not about the dead rat. It's about the organism. It's about the, about the ideas. Um, so you're working now in this in uh, as a as a postdoc in the in this mollusk lab working on mussels. Uh, do you foresee continuing to look at this particular area of animals, of, or do you want to branch out? I mean, do you what are you what are you looking at in the future? Wow, it's like you're asking me what the contents of my job application do next week are. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I, I think what's important for me in the future is to keep looking at patterns of environmental variation and how that will change with climate change. In terms of what animal I'll study, it does not have to be what I'm currently studying. I'll always love nudibranchs. They'll always be that weekend side project, uh, just like they were in my PhD. They weren't my PhD either. <laughs> but I... I hope to stay with aquatic systems, but it's really, you know, looking for the best organism that will answer that question about climate change is what I'm really interested in. Right. And I think it's really, I think what you're mentioning the side projects and also how this paper on nudibranchs was a weekend side project. It was this, hey, I'm going to go out and, oh, look at this. That's fascinating. And hmm. our best paper yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of how that that weekend side project for you 
how it fits into your schedule and how it keeps things going. And, um, you know, just for the scientific process, there are lots of times when you think of things being very planned, you know, you mm. know observation, <laughs> hypothesis, you plan the experiment and do all that stuff. But a lot of science also is just, it's kind of this magical moment of discovery. Yeah. And I think that's what keeps a lot of us engaged is having these little things that we have this closeted interest in or something that your boss tells you is a, you know, don't do that. Focus on your main project, but everyone has them. My side projects right now are finishing my papers for my PhD, which is a little bit less interesting, right. but <laughs> I, when we went to the beach to go look for them that first time, it was me and one of my best friends from grad school. And we were just going cause we loved looking at them. And then we realized that we had enough a large enough sample size to do an experiment that we had coincidentally already set up in the lab. And we thought, oh, this will be easy. And here we are three years later, now sequencing these animals with another collaborator spending thousands of dollars. And it's kind of snowballed, but in a great way. Yeah, talk, talk a little bit about that. I'd love to know so that you're sequencing them now and you're, going, you're actually going to be digging into what's changing. So we're looking at the population genetics. Uh, we have a collaborator at Berkeley. So both me and Eric, the first author on the paper have moved on. He's in France and I'm in Washington, but someone that we knew pretty well, um, Rory Bowie in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology uh, is pretty interested in population genetics of these animals. And we actually don't know anything about their population genetics. Um, so this would kind of be a first pass at looking at the genetic diversity uh, how you can, how their physiology might map back onto that genetic diversity, so, which is something that we've done with the sea hares um, already. And so it's kind of the next step into looking at possible mechanisms, which is always the end goal in these theoretical biology realms. Right. It's the, you know, physiology. You want to actually get to the mechanisms, what's right. happening in there. Why? How does it work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the how question, not the uh, why yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is so much harder. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Blair, did you have any more questions about nudibranchs or, uh, or other aspects of Dr. Tanner's work? Oh, I just, I have a million. We could talk about it forever, but I think that <laughs> <laughs> ultimately, <laughs> Um, my question is um, kind of what your, in, in all of these kind of different experiences you've had with the intertidal to this point with looking at these different organisms and their responses to climate change, what is your big takeaway thus far? Have you had a big aha moment? Are you seeing this big trend that you really want people to take away from your work so far? Is there something, this big question mark that you have that you're still trying to find out? Because it seems like there's this through line between all these different things you've been looking at very clearly, right? So, mm -hmm. so have you seen a link? Is there some big question or thought that's coming out of all this? Well, I think the, the first very small one is that everything is going to be okay. Um, the <laughs> ecosystem will move on with or without us. So uh, it's just a matter of whether we want to kind of slow the changes that we've already made. Um, but the big question that's still remaining for me is, again, this how, this mechanism. What underlies this ability to be plastic, this ability to change your physiology with certain cues in the environment. And uh, especially um, what Justin mentioned like weeks back, the predictability of the environment. I'm really interested in the heritability of these short-term changes because it can't happen at the genetic level. It, it's happening in within one individual's lifespan. So how are they doing this? And how are they passing this ability off to their offspring? That's, I just, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. There's a lot that also has been coming out in plant research uh, related to epigenetics and, oh, and yeah. these effects that are multi-generational where you have mm -hmm. one parent that has stress three generations down the line. They're still exhibiting some aspect of this stress that was experienced during their life. So right. it's not genetic. It's something yeah. different. Mm -hmm. That's yeah probably what my lab will be looking at uh, once I move past here. We are working on some preliminary stuff right now, but it's hard when there's no 
genome. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you have to have what is the basic blueprint that all of the right. those mutations and the 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 epigenetic manipulations mm -hmm. work on. What what yeah. are they actually uh, building on? And right. then and then that doesn't matter. And you're going to want a ton of RNA seq data to see yes. what's being RNA -seq. at specific time points along yes. the. Yeah, it gets. It gets, there's more fun ahead. Oh, and then you want protein because RNA isn't actually what is being produced. Or, uh, pr uh, pr yeah, protein. I'm sorry. Yes. No, protein. no, no. You want both. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> we have all of it. That's exactly what I'm doing. You know, is the, is the nudibranch genome a very large one? Is it? Do you have any uh, idea? Yes, the uh, there is a model C hair that's used for neuroscience oh. research. Actually, mm -hmm. the Aplesia californica, oh. and oh my god, it's eight hundred kilobase. It's not the largest and not the smallest. It's pretty average size. Okay. All right, yeah. Nice, 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 nice. It was an animal with an average sized <laughs> genome. <laughs> But outsized responses. Yes, I would. I love. I love getting to hear about all this stuff. Where can people find out more about you and follow you online? I have a website that I try and keep updated uh, when I'm not doing research. It's <laughs> just my name. dot com. Tanner. dot com, and all of my social media handles are exactly the same. Just my name. <laughs> you you got in there early. There either yeah. that or. There uh, are no, a lot no of one people with your name. name. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Rochelle, R-I-C-H-E-L-L-E, Tanner, T-A-N-N-E-R, dot com. You can find her website, which um, has a blog, information on her research projects. And like you heard here, you can follow her on social media as well. and Find out more about Noki and her science and science communication I'm not going to say escapades. <laughs> that, I like that, <laughs> actually. I, I, I try not to escapade. Yeah. It's hard to say. Um, and I'll also, just because we were talking about Noki a bunch, I'll throw in there as well that you can find out more about Noki at climateinterpreter.org. At uh, Twitter, it's at underscore Noki, N-N-O-C-C-I, um, or on Facebook, National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. Because we did talk a little... Um, inside baseball a few times about it. So if you heard something you're really interested about, you can hop on over there. There it is. And you could read more about the study there too, because we wrote yes. we wrote about it there. <laughs> yeah, Rochelle wrote a blog all about it. So yeah. Oh, and something I did see for those uh, scientists who might be listening to this and wondering, oh, what is this methodology of uh, talking about science that Noki uses? What is their uh, what is their framework for talking about stuff? You can actually learn about it for free from Noki. There is uh, Rochelle, do you have the information on that? I don't have it right offhand, but I read about it as I was surfing through web links today. We have multiple courses in lots of different formats. They're all outlined on Climate Interpreter. You just have to make a free account. Um, we also can bring a training to you or your institution and you just request one of those. You can email me because the email will eventually come to me anyway um, or request it through Climate Interpreter. But yeah, we'd be happy to give a talk at your conference or institution. Yeah, and right. Kiki just pulled up as well. Uh, there is a Frameworks Academy that is an online course. I want to say it's uh, 10 hours, something like that. Mm -hmm. It is a um, multi-module course um, that gives you kind of a nice overview to the methodology that is used. But um, like Rochelle mentioned, we are all about person to person. So we as a community are all over the country and are super excited to come to your organization or do local trainings for people. So uh, yeah, absolutely reach out to Rochelle about that. Timed out on that web link anyway. Yeah, so I think this is a, this is wonderful. Rochelle, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been wonderful to talk with you. And um, I know you have, you have, a, you have a pup to go put to bed. So <laughs> it's not enough. Me. Rochelle has a full-time job. She's looking at Nuna Branks <laughs> on weekends. She also has a puppy. 
So <laughs> And it's it's not a nudibrank puppy. It's a real no, dog a real puppy. puppy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Left the pet nudibranchs behind in grad school. <laughs> thank you for here. having me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I hope our paths cross again. It's just wonderful to see the work that you're doing. And thank you for sharing tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for stopping by. So fun. All right, everyone. Just to remind you, RochelleTanner.com is the website you can use if you are interested in more in the work that she's doing. And uh, Noki, we will, we will have these links on our website, twist.org. It is time for us now to take a quick break so stay tuned for more this week in science we will be back with all that news about sleep and airplanes and whatever it is that justin brought so <laughs> that's <laughs> see that is just surprise science coming up after the break <laughs> we'll see you soon Explain things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way to go. A new conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. Put on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see. The answers lie somewhere. Hey everyone. Oh yeah. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for listening to the show or watching it if you're watching it on YouTube right now. I would love to remind you at this moment that if you haven't paid a visit to twist.org, that is where you can find a pop-up window where you can sign up for our newsletter. That's right. We're sending out a newsletter now. Not on a monthly schedule. You can get our newsletter if you sign up. If you don't get that pop-up, you can email me, Kirsten, at thisweekinscience.com, and I will put you on our mailing list. Also at twist.org are our wonderful links to all sorts of fun, twisty things. If you're interested in helping This Week in Science keep doing what we do, at twist.org, you can easily find our... Let me find my links right here. There we go. Twist.org, you can find links to all sorts of ways that you can help support the show and support independent, woman-run science podcasting. That's right, independent. Nobody else runs this show. We do. You do. You help produce this show. We cannot do it without your help. The Zazzle Store is a place where you can find goodies that are have all of the twist uh, logos on them the twist logos and uh, uh, the twist logos and also art from Blair's Animal Corner calendars there's lots of products t-shirts and uh, mugs and wonderful things that would be a lot of fun for you to have that do support what we do at Twist. Also, the Patreon link that'll take you to our Patreon community where you can help support what we do through a monthly donation. $10 a month and we will thank you on the show. That's right, $10 and more a month. We will thank you on the show. $25 a month, you get a t-shirt, all sorts of fun fun goodies for you over at our Patreon community, plus some freebies that only patrons of Twist get. You can subscribe here. Click on the orange button to subscribe. YouTube, iTunes, Google Play. It'll take you to an easy subscription interface. So if you know somebody who is not subscribed, send them to twist.org and tell them to click that sub subscribe button. Also, an easy way to make a one-time donation is to click the yellow donate button on the sidebar. That is a PayPal button. It will go to our PayPal account and help us to buy Blair a new computer. We are going halvesies with Blair on a new computer, which she needs because her computer is dying. It's pretty much dead. We're testing out a Chromebook tonight, and we're not super happy with it. So we would like to have a computer that can handle the streaming and do all the nice things. And so to do that, it's going to cost us some money and, well, 
it's, it's going to cost Blair some money, but it's going to be for a lot of twist work. So we are going halvesies. And so we would love your help to be able to make that happen. We would love to get a new computer. Keep the show uh, going. And I, I don't know. We might be having to buy Justin a new sound card also. So <laughs> with all these things happening at once. We technology. Okay. But anyway, your help will help us deal with these technological issues and, you know, with style and aplomb and to continue bringing you This Week in Science weekly to your ears, to your eyes, and to your brains. We cannot do this without you. We cannot do this without you. Thank you so much for your support. Explain things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way to go. New conclusion. The methods are hypothesis. And we're back with more this week in science. Yeah, we're back. We are back with more this week in science. Okay, it is time for that part of the show we like to call this weekend. What has science done for me lately? lately? What has it done? Oh, this wonderful letter this week. I have, this letter makes me so happy. Dear Kiki, Justin, and Blair, good science to you. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you for making my favorite podcast and source of fun facts. You're welcome. Thank you for us being your favorite. That's awesome. Since discovering Twists some months ago, I've been having such a great and interesting time going back through the archives of Twistery, apologies for that corniness, and having my mind blown repeatedly. I work a very menial job as a stewardess on a yacht and have felt my brain slowly turning to mush with lack of stimulation. Twist keeps me thinking and curious and has inspired me to really try and figure out what to do with my life. I'm 23 and desperate to go to university to study a science of some sort, but I just can't pick. Between marine biology, astronomy, and geology, my mind just can't be made. Do anyway, all of it. All of it. <laughs> do all the things. That's right. Find the thread. Put them together. I think this is exoplanet studies, right? <laughs> anyway, congratulations on getting to 13,000 subscribers on YouTube. I know this because I persuaded my friend and co-worker Charlene to hit the subscribe button and had, this sa had the supreme satisfaction of watching 12,999 turn to 13,000. No way. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah. So what has science done for me lately? Jumbo Coffee Queen percolators and the process of extracting goodness from coffee beans in general. The sheer efficiency of putting the grounds in the filter, some water in the tank, and within minutes having 1.9 liters of energizing Arabica infused hot water. It's almost magic. It's science. So so and I could not work it without it. I could not work the long shifts and maintain sanity without it. Science also gives us pure drinking water on board. We use a reverse osmosis desalinator to turn the salt water of the ocean into clean, fresh water, which we then treat with a UV filter and can drink. So no matter how long we're at sea, we always have plenty of water to drink. Thanks again for this kick-ass show. I really do love it and find you all so cool and inspiring. Best regards from the Ionian Islands and from your number one Zimbabwean fan, Sarah Forfar. And she says, P.S. Blair, I recently saw a video of these cute little scorpions, or maybe they were tiny crabs, and they were all scurrying around on a piece of, I can't read this, I need to move my screen around. Oh, and they were yeah. all scurrying around on a piece of paper, and then someone would draw a circle around them in pen, in pen, and the little guys got super confused and seemed trapped in this little ring of ink. Can oh, you no. explain what's happening oh, here? No. Thanks, and have a fantastically scientific week. So I can do some research and maybe be a little more scientific about this. But what I can tell you is I also saw this on the Internet. It made the rounds. It is a relative to scorpions, um, but they're they're kind of almost tick like. Um, but they have these giant uh, 
basically like crab claws. <laughs> They're great. They're so funny looking. Um, but they they are responding to the pens kind of like how if you put um, a square of tape on the ground, a cattle sit in it. Right. So there's some sort of psychological process happening where they think it's a barrier, even though it's just pen. Um, again, I'm not sure exactly biologically if we know what's going on, if that's a trigger of something that happens to them in their environment. I could do some more digging and try to figure that out. But um, for whatever reason, yeah, the pen is making them think that there's a barrier. I don't know, Kiki, if you can find it, but it's maybe in the after show. We'll, I'll see if I can find it and I'll send it to you. But it's, yeah, yeah it, it's somebody who just has these little critters on a piece of paper and they, they draw a circle around it and they're like, uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. And then they back up <laughs> over it accidentally. And then they're like, how did I get here? I don't know how to get here. What? It's That's amazing. great. Yeah. I haven't seen it. I can't wait to see it. And yeah, maybe yeah. we can talk about it, figure yeah. out what was actually happening. Sarah, thank you so much for writing. We appreciate your letter so much. Thank you for getting your friend Charlene to get us to 13,000 YouTube subscribers. That's wonderful. Everybody did that. It would double our numbers. If every one of our subscribers got one more person to subscribe, hello, we would be growing like gangbusters. That's how, how big an impact each of you has on us. Thank you for writing in. If any of you want to write in with what has science done for you lately, send me an email, kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Put a message on our Facebook page. That's right, This Week in Science on Facebook. Send us a message and we will read it on the show. We want to keep this section of the show full of your letters, so keep writing in. And now we're going to keep talking about science. I'm getting sleepy. Ugh. Do you guys feel like you are really well rested after, I don't know, six hours of sleep? Nope. <laughs> How many hours of sleep do you need to feel rested? Twelve. Uh, so <laughs> from the moment I hit the pillow until my alarm goes off, eight and a half. Eight and a half. I'm at, I'm at about eight and a half, nine myself. When yeah. I get, I can I can make do on about a day of six hours of sleep. But yeah, I am not the kind of person who can do that long term. I, yeah, I, no, I, I've no. I've met people who who uh, continually and with the same energy they put into the, into a normal day have done four hours a night. Oh yeah, and yeah. I don't understand it at all. It makes. I no had sense a professor who said not everyone needs eight hours. And he got four hours sleep every night for his entire life. He swore yeah. and he thought it was fine. And I've met people who like who are like this, who have like, a, they go work out, they exercise. It's not like they're just conserving energy all day. No. <laughs> they're no. going out and they're... being in the world like normal humans and having maybe more energy. Well, what yeah. it turns out. And it turns out that those people are insane. There's no way that you can survive on four hours of sleep. So Kiki got yeah. uh, really interrupted by the internet. Oh, wait. Uh, wait. You, and you're muted. Hang on. Kiki, oh, wait, we can't hear up. you. She's in fast speed. Uh, she's, oh, she's, no. I think she thinks that we're the ones that have been uh, yeah, she, booted off. and she, She's she lost know. in the internet forever. <laughs> she's like, Kiki, her soul come has back. Been sucked, her soul has been sucked out hey. of the, you know, she's trapped in this parallel universe. Oh, no. Oh, no. She's broken. But I'm pretty good at lip syncing. She was saying something about there being a gene that was discovered that is present in people who uh, who ride horses Hi. dressed like small dogs. I don't know. Hello. Maybe I didn't figure it out. Oh, hello, Kiki. You're back. This is my weird glitch that I hoped I had gotten rid of with a driver update, but I apparently have not. Well, you're back now. What? Where did I lose? Where did you lose me? Uh, so we all agreed that uh, there were people who could function on very little sleep. Yes. Okay. So the whole story. All right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes so these people are mutants. They have a mutation or maybe a couple of mutations that have given them this ability to not need a lot of sleep. In 2009, researchers described a gene called DEC2. There's a mutation in it that led to a mother-daughter pair. 
being very well rested on a short amount of sleep, six hours-ish. However, researchers now are publishing a new study in the journal Neuron, where they have studied another family who are all short sleepers, not just early birds, but just short sleepers. And they found another mutation, which is found in only about, they think the, the prevalence is only about one, or excuse me, four in every 100,000 people. So it's very rare. The mutation affects a gene called ADRB1, ADRB1. And this encodes for a receptor uh, for noradrenaline. Rebecca, you, you guys familiar with noradrenaline? Mm -mm. No, noradrenaline. Adrenaline, does that ring a bell? Mm -hmm. And right. Ad Nora is so no nose adrenaline. So basically Wait, no. it is no, it's basically <laughs> adrenaline. This is this is this this signaling molecule in the in the brain, in the body. Noradrenaline, it's a stimulant in our brains. It wakes you up. And they looked at mice uh that have uh these neurons in this uh the brain stem and that have this receptor all over it, and they uh manipulated the receptor. So stimulating the ADRB1 brainstem neurons in the mice woke up the mice if they were in a very deep sleep. And from this study, identifying mutation in the family and also seeing how it works in mice and that they could potentially manipulate it to make the mice not need as much sleep, uh, that this mutation is basically making these brainstem neurons more active. And if they're more active, then, and this is the part of the brainstem, this is the deep brain that makes everything else go. And so if those neurons are active and not needing sleep, then the rest of the brain and the body are going to follow suit. They want to do future studies to figure out whether or not they can recreate this mutation with drugs. So for instance, make uh, soldiers need less sleep or shift workers need less sleep or well, maybe that movie, we, limitless right right limitless <laughs> yeah maybe it could go the other direction though and help treat sleep disorders so, okay, so maybe this so will so give I, a, a clue in that direction i have a question <laughs> yes we need sleep Right? Like biologically, that's what rebuilds telomeres. We can heal, yeah. right? So is there a potential negative impact to being a person who just generally sleeps less? Do these people not live as long? Do these people not heal as quickly? Or no, is there really the no reason that we sleep as long as we do? Yeah, I don't know that there is. I mean, we do, we have this general idea that it it's good for us that we need it. And yeah, we do. <laughs> People become uh, basically drunk. You know, you have similar right, deficit yeah. to alcohol when you don't sleep. Um, and it, you, you can nauseous. die if you, yeah, I you can die headache. if you don't sleep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's important. But at the same time, the extent of its importance, whether or not it actually uh, leads to longevity or not, is we don't know that. And the, the evidence, as far as I recall at this moment, I don't think it's, I mean, early birds, I think, are likely to live a long time. They're likely to live longer, I think. Am I remembering this correctly? I don't well, know. I'm, I know have to, I'm going to have to look into that. about how like, shift work can impact yeah. your, your life expectancy yeah. too, right? So, right. But part that's of not, that that's is, circadian rhythms and being off off rhythm right but i thought that was because the quality of sleep was different because you're not supposed to be asleep so this is kind of mm -hmm. down to the initial question of if if you don't need as much sleep and you're a shift worker and you can suddenly make yourself okay on four hours sleep will that reverse some of those impacts because you're not getting mm -hmm. as many quality hours as this person who's laying down for the same amount of hours but at the right time yeah. of day so right I think really the the linchpin here for me is whether there's any negative impact of sleeping less if you have this mutation. 
Well, I, I guess that it's a little bit of a troubleshooter know. if we if if there is and this if this population of short sleepers could be just studied through metadata or something that's already out there. Uh, but uh, it might be interesting to 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 know if there isn't any real health deficiencies from a four hour sleeper. Really, maybe all the healing time could be done in less than four hours. Maybe it's done in in two hours. Yeah, you know, maybe you know maybe it takes place right away. Uh, and, and it doesn't really require, or maybe, much. yeah, or maybe it's kind of like, uh, rendering cycles where it kind of, maybe it like goes over it once and then doing it again, helps it be higher, higher resolution. <laughs> so but doing it see, once is fine. Is... Sleeping another sleep cycle just sets everything a little bit more solidly. I don't know. This is blowing my mind because biologically animals need sleep. And if there was a mutation that occurred naturally that allowed you to sleep less and not have any negative impacts, I feel like that would have rippled through the animal kingdom except with everything except for maybe, I guess, apex predators. I don't know, which technically I guess we are, which might explain some of that. But there are animals that, that are potential prey animals that still sleep a lot of hours. And it might benefit them to be awake and to be grazing or to be actively aware of their story like do you understand or, i'm so confused so so, so one yeah. of the things one of the things i could throw out there at least uh, <laughs> that would be beneficial for uh, uh, uh that would be less beneficial for the rest of the animal kingdom but can possibly uh work that way with humans is that we can turn this daytime on <laughs> anytime we want uh most of the animal kingdom there's going to be a period of time when their eyes aren't adjusted for the the world that they're in the, the right. they're, or you know or that the the prey that they would be going after may not be out there so there's there's a lot of i think more you know eh, why fix the thing if it ain't broke it's going on in the animal kingdom they don't have shift work like we do they have pretty regular schedules yeah i don't know i just feel like you, i feel like you would see more of this even just in humans not like there's a benefit to being awake more okay so here's a here's I the mean, next place to look here's the next place to look uh you go to arctic regions and see what sleep cycles are like during the 24-hour sun times and sure. see how those might be different that would be kind of fun to take a look at mm -hmm. right when the sun is out all the time right yeah that would be interesting well i i mean the interesting aspect is these short sleepers who have the mutations they are just fine so they're they're not feeling a detriment. They're not there's there's no detriment to them. Now, I feel a little bit cheated yeah. not having this gene. Yeah. I know I want four it. Four hours of my life every day. There's stuff I could be doing with this time. Yeah, I just found a statistic that it's only it's only about one percent of the world's population are these short sleepers who need, say, less than six hours of sleep a night. I mean, with the conversation we were just having about the nudibranchs was all about trade-offs. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. I just, it's the trade -off? so hard for me to think that there is no trade off for this. Congratulations. You just don't have to sleep as much. End of story. You know, there's, I feel like there's some, there's something I, I want I more it. studies. I, <laughs> I would love it to be true. And I want that pill to, <laughs> quote, to you know, to quote <laughs> the film, but uh, yeah, I, I want, I want more studies because I'm very curious. I really feel like there's something else here. There might be, there might be, well, there are other things out there, other planets that we might want to look at, for instance. And when we look at them, we're looking for life, really, right? We want to know whether, or the potential for habitability. And we've talked before about kind of that, the gases in the atmosphere and what we're looking at around these planets. But we so far can only really see visible light and visible light doesn't give us the, the, what we can see so far doesn't give us the exact spectrum to determine a lot of the chemical makeup, the chemistry in the atmospheres surrounding these planets. And that's something that's going to be really an essential part of determining whether or not the atmosphere is suitable for life. So some researchers at McGill University this is a an undergraduate with her advisor uh, writing on her her undergraduate thesis. Put this 
project together and published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society just today. They have modeled based on satellite data, the SciSat, S-C-I-S-A-T, satellite data. They've constructed an infrared fingerprint for the Earth. So this is a satellite, a Canadian satellite, that looks down on our planet in the infrared to be able to look at particular bio biosignatures for uh, various purposes. And they took the data, created this fingerprint with the specific idea that nobody yet had created this image. Nobody had looked using infrared at the earth and put it together and said, this is what we're going to look like to aliens, really. And so now they've published it. And now we have a, a, a biosignature, a fingerprint that we can try and match other exoplanets to earth. That's a very clever idea. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty neat idea. So the, uh, this SISAT, um, satellite is interesting because it does kind of look at the earth's uh, atmosphere it's looking mostly it was it was started to um it was created not started it was created to help us understand what was going on in the ozone layer and so it was looking at our planet as the earth passes in front of the sun so really it was looking at a transit of the Earth in front of the sun, which is exactly how we look for exoplanets. We just don't yet have an infrared telescope out there to make these observations, these transit observations on other planets. But, dun dun dun, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to be an infrared telescope with a launch date of 2021, which is finally completed. They built it. It's all in it's all in one piece now. Oh this is goodness. this is really good news. I mean, I'm I've been on the the doubter side of whether the James Webb telescope is ever going to end up out there, but according to news out this week, yes indeed. We've built it. The next step will be launching it, but once it gets out there, these uh these researchers also modeled the TRAPPIST-1 system. And this is a planet, this is a system, a, a red dwarf star, which is Funky, kind of a- Close planets. Yeah, yeah, it's got some really close in planets that they pass in front of their star fairly regularly, which would make viewing them pretty easily, uh, pretty easy. And they also, um, they additionally being a red dwarf, it's not really bright. So it they this, the brightness of the star doesn't, uh, it, it's not so bright that it uh, outweighs that dimming from the tran transits of it of the planets that are going around it. And so the it's a great system to model. And so they modeled that system in this particular study and showed what they should be looking for on the various planets that are orbiting around the Trappist-1 red dwarf star and how we should be looking for it. So modeled it in the near infrared and also uh, medium uh, infrared wavelengths to determine how we can look at the planets to figure out whether they have oxygen, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, what is in the atmosphere. So pretty exciting. Right. Fingerprint for Earth. We now have an infrared one. Nice. Pretty cool. Tell me a story, Justin. Uh, okay, so this is another Toxoplasma gondii story. The baby blinding, suicide, and schizophrenia triggering one of the leading causes of death by foodborne illness. Single cell parasite that only reproduces in cats. And it is added again. This time, it's uh, killing sea otters. Which... It's been killing sea otters, hasn't it? Well, ah, yes, uh, it has. Uh, this is actually something that did start back in the 90s, uh, at least the study did, into the death uh, associated mm -hmm. with T. gondii and sea otters in the wild southern sea otters of California. So there's lots of infection in this population with toxogondii, uh, toxoplasma gondii. But it is only, according to the, what I was reading, the infection is 
fatal for only a fraction of sea otters with the parasite, which is not a lot if you assume a fraction to be small. Right. Uh, Fractions come in many yeah, sizes. Yeah, yeah. You have a fraction of any fraction itself is just a big so They just okay. mean not all of them. Yes. Yes. It's only if, some. But if they had said one, you would assume, oh, well, unlucky otter. But no, that would be that would have been all of them based on anyway. Uh, so uh, according to this is this was a uh, examination of sea otter carcasses between 1998 and 2001. T. Gandhi was determined to be the primary cause of death for 17 percent of the otters, and it contributed to mortality in another 12 percent. So pretty significant uh, fraction of the population. But what that was interesting is the the T. Gandhi infection is much broader than that. Uh, but of course, not all T. Gandhi strains are equal. There are different varieties. This is uh, the study came out of University of California at Davis, and it identifies the parasite specific strains that were linked to the deaths. And it turns out this study was pretty clever because they were also tracking felines on land. And they managed to trace the strain of T. gondii that was killing these sea otters to feral domestic cats and bobcats in a nearby hmm. watershed. So this is directly related to the question I asked on the show last week, whether it's just uh, domestic cats or if wild cats are affected. So it sounds like indeed, yes. Wild yeah, cat. it usually said that uh, it reproduces in felines. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's uh, the but colloquially, I never really know if they mean like all felines or yeah. just, you know. Yeah, it's all, it's got to be all the cats. Well, I don't know. Uh, it'd be interesting. I mean, you could find out really quick whether or not they have the, the gene to produce the enzyme that breaks down the uh, linoleic acid. Right? Well, I remember yeah. a, a number of years ago when, when we were, were first talking about sea otters with Toxo. There was a hypothesis that it was coming through flushable kitty litter into mm -hmm. the yes. water column. Yes. Yep. So this is sounding like, at least in Southern California, it sounds well, like well, hold, it's coming it. from cats in the area. Well, so the strain uh, that's ki that's killing them is different. So it looks like what I, what I guess we, we could still assume is that the it could still be flushed kitty litter, litter from released sewage water that is infecting the majority of them. Uh, but in this pop in the one, the, but it's the deadly strain seems to be coming from the watershed and, and is being there because they could actually find it there in the feral cats and the bobcats. Um, so it's really interesting because they linked on land to what's going on in the waters. One of the in other interesting things I think about this, uh, study is they, uh, they point out that sea otters are very well studied, uh, in the marine life off the coast. Uh, there are, there's only the sort of general knowledge of Toxoplasma gondii effects on other marine life. So it's not that it's just attacking sea otters. It is that sea otters are very well studied. And that's, that's sort of how, uh, they were able to detect and put this. There was previous research that showed that up to 70% of stranded sea otters were infected with T. gondii. I think that might be the study that uh, sort of got this interest kicked off uh, and got the UC Davis folks involved in doing this uh, further investigation. That is just the, the, I, I, we've known about toxoplasma and sea otters for years and I never was like, Oh, what other animals is it affecting? Where else is it affecting? It was just, scientists discovered it in sea otters so that's the species that they discovered I, I thought it was a specialized kind of thing not just that sea otters were very studied and so that's why they found it in them yeah. they just hadn't looked at other animals maybe yes, yes. Uh, so if you think about it you have you have felines you have rodents you have now mustelids you have weasel yeah. family and now you also have this uh, idea that it affects humans as well primates oh no that's w so, it's very well known that it yeah, affects humans. So, yeah so it's, it's basically anything have, that's warm blooded they know yeah. right so it's this cross taxonomic 
huge groups, right? So it's not even like, oh, it's just carnivores because you have rodents in there. Um, so it has some sort of impact across all these different kinds of mammals. So it does kind of make sense that just if, if you look hard enough, you might find it in some more. <laughs> like just yeah, yeah. It's just it's just that yeah. If you find a dead or um, ailing sea otter, it's going to get tested. Absolutely, because right. they're so well protected. Yeah. But what about other animals? They're yeah. they're probably not tested, right? Yeah, yeah. and so how and, many? And it's it's because the the more that you know we've been talking about this. I gosh, uh, for the entire length of the show has existed. Yeah. Point. And it there's never like, oh, Toxoplasma gondii found to be helping salmon yeah. and their salmon runs. Now, there's no, there's nothing that we're getting that's like really great news about. You could even wonder, is it affecting deer? Are deer easier caught by mountain lions because of Toxoplasmosis, <laughs> Do they right? become attracted to the scent of uh, cougar pee? Yeah. Like, yeah, there's no way to know until you start testing it. It could be everywhere. Mm -hmm. you know and what's it, like, everywhere what you're gonna yeah. say something oh well yeah anywhere that there's cats you know and there's there are uh probably a hundred million uh cats or more in this country uh and apparently it's and it's not just here it's, it's everywhere it's around the world it's around the world yep yep affecting sea otters around the world maybe <gasps> but you know what's gonna affect us right now Around the world. Yeah, maybe around the world. Maybe around the world. Blair's Animal Corner. Oh, yeah. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. By pet, little pet, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant patterns and squirrels. And a what you got, Blair? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, if you've ever been to an airport, which I imagine many of you have, you may look out on the tarmac and see these individuals who are flashing their lights, helping direct the planes in, and they have big, fat noise cancelers on trying to save their precious ears. Well, you know who don't have those big headphones to block out airplane noise just wildlife yeah. in the area <laughs> especially <laughs> everyone birds. else yeah so this is a study out of manchester metropolitan university and the institute of biology leiden um, and they have looked at the imp impact of anthropogenic noise on birds specifically around airports um now earlier studies looking at uh birds like great tits and chiff chaffs chiff chaff uh, say that a million times it's just it nah, brings a smile that. to your face every time chiff chaff um chiff -chaff. and many other bird species have found that um when they are in urban areas they have a noise sh dependent shift in song frequency. So when they're in really loud urban areas, their song frequency will actually go higher. Um, so they're trying to get over this low level kind of hum of white noise of urban development. So um, their songs will go higher in pitch. Um, and so that would in theory, help them be heard over the low frequency noises of traffic. Aircrafts are different. They are so loud and the noise is so wide in frequencies that it actually covers all frequencies of sound that we know about in terms of noise, right? So the, mm -hmm. the, we can hear that birds can hear. It covers all of the frequencies. So it doesn't, there's no benefit to them to going in in higher in frequency because it's across all the frequencies, right? So this new study looking at specifically chiff chaffs, <laughs> um, they, it sounds like they sing at lower frequencies when they're near noisy runways. Um, but they think that the reason for this, because remember, this covers all the frequencies, right, is actually they think that the, that this is because they're going deaf. 
So just like, you know, there's the very high pitched sounds that younger people can hear. And then as you get older, you can hear less and less of those. So that's what they think is happening here, that these birds are going deaf. So their songs are actually going lower. Um, And so (laughs) meanwhile, something else is also happening at British airports. And that is that birds are getting more aggressive. Um, so there's a couple ideas because they this can't might hear each other. Yes. So there, the first actual so the, the um, hypothesis, Not well, the right. first hypothesis that they have, that these researchers have about why they might be more aggressive is actually that it's just noise induced physiological stress. They are just stressed out and they're on edge because it's loud and it's, ah, right. Um, or it could be from dis- disturbed communication. They just are having trouble hearing each other. I think that just when you're deaf or you're going deaf, but you used to be able to hear, you're probably more jumpy, right? If somebody can sneak up on you and poke you on your shoulder, you're going to, ha, where'd you come from, right? So if you're right. a bird, it makes sense to me that you would be more aggressive. But there's the other side of it, which is that birds use their calls to set out their territory. If you can Mm -hmm. hear me, you're probably too close to my territory. And so if they're no longer able to hear each other's calls, maybe at distance, they're getting closer together before they do Mm -hmm. come across each other. And by then, it's a situation of each bird thinking the other is on their territory. And so that's going to escalate quickly as opposed to just the call and response. Oh, okay. You're there. I'm over here. You're there. I'm over here. You know, it. Yeah. Well, and absolutely that. So in um, most kind of competitive displays in the animal kingdom, um, be it uh, male lions competing for the head, of a, yeah. of a pride or it's a couple of deer fighting over a specific territory with big uh, antlers with big racks uh, those situations they call them escalating behaviors right they kind yeah. of size each other up get closer and closer but in most cases don't ever make physical contact because it is so risky and energetically expensive and this is exactly mm-hmm. the same they use their songs to identify their space they will get closer and closer But physical fights don't often actually manifest when these birds are trying to um, stake out their territories. When they can signal each other with their calls. Yeah, so they can signal each other. They can hear each other coming, all this kind of stuff. But the second that they can't hear each other very well um, or anticipate each other's movements, that becomes a problem. So, of course, this is a worldwide concern. There are airports everywhere. There are lots of animals that live near airports. Um, in Manchester Airport, where they were doing this study, they um, anticipate, they think there's around 16,000 individuals from 100 different species experiencing aircraft-related hearing loss. And so this could have, even just at this one airport, that's a pretty big impact. So knowing that, um, there there's a lot of different thoughts about where to go from here. Um, I couldn't help but think about the fact that there's been lots of conversation about the potential for electric airplanes. And even if you just found a way to use some sort of electric power during takeoff, you could greatly reduce the amount of jet engine noise. Right. You know, any any kind of noise reduction would be yeah. helpful. There's also the hey birds. Maybe you should move someplace else. There is that too, which is a very interesting point. Why are they hanging out? Why are they hanging out? I like the big metal birds. (laughs) The big metal birds keep the hawks away. Yeah. Um, So I will move from what is potentially a very mm, unintelligent bird choice to a story about very intelligent bird choices. Um, so I had to, of course, bring an amazing story about New Caledonian crows, our Yay. buddies that make tools, that store tools, that design tools, um, that can pick the best tool for an opportunity. They are so good at it. They are so smart. And a new study 
um, this is coming out of Harvard, tells us that they might actually really enjoy um, making tools, using tools, and solving puzzles. Um, so this is a study looking at optimism in crows before and after using tools. And the lead researcher says, just the same way we enjoy something like solving a crossword, crows actually enjoyed using tools. They get satisfaction out of doing things they're good at, have trained for their whole lives for, and that they use frequently. So this sounds pretty outrageous that, that we'd be able to make this claim. So I want to take a step back and explain how they came to this conclusion. Um, so the New Caledonian crows are super well known for their tool use, um, but they wanted to see how using tools made them feel. So what they did um, is they, in a lab, they trained crows to identify um, where different areas of the room would um, have large rewards and small rewards. So in particular, they were in particular looking at one um, table. And on the left side of the table, if there was a box on the left side and the crow opened it, there would be a large reward, three pieces of meat. If it was on the right side of the table and they opened it, there would be a small scrap of meat, a far smaller <laughs> reward. So they trained these crows to know the difference between right slide bad reward, left side, jackpot, right? And then they slowly moved that box towards the center. And eventually it was dead center in the table. Um, and so that was measured as their optimism. Glass half full, glass half empty. If the bird quickly came to investigate the box, they were optimistic that there was a large reward in there. If they waited or didn't visit at all, they were pessimistic. Uh, there's probably nothing good in there anyway. So then yeah, they wanted to there, see. Should, sorry. Go I'm ahead. Picturing, I'm picturing another category was probably the outlier, which was the wishful thinking one that went and nudged it to the left or the right before opening it. Like, like went, and <laughs> the, went and nudged it a little bit to the right yeah. side of the table. And like then if I put it, it over there, yeah, then it'll, maybe then it'll, then it'll, it'll magically work. have more. Yeah. <laughs> well, remember, crows also know object permanence. So they know that whatever's in there is in there. So interesting to bring that up. Um, so then to test how this is related to tool use, they were put through a series of tests over a number of days, one in which they had to use a tool to uh, get a piece of meat from a box. This is a different box. Okay. And another in which the meat was just, they could just grab it. Um, so they did find um, that they were in a quote unquote good mood as a result of using the tools. But then they thought, okay, haha, what if it wasn't them enjoying the tool use, but it was them working harder for food and therefore being more hungry or that being more fun or who knows, but maybe it was just working harder for the food. So then they added additional conditions. In one, the meat was on the table, no effort at all, just on a plate. And in another condition, they dispersed it around the enclosure in four different corners. So they had to fly <laughs> around to get to the meat. So it was still more effort. It but they didn't need to use a tool to get it. And they found that following tool use, the birds were quicker to approach the ambiguous bo box and much less enthusiastic after the effortful test as compared to the easy test. So it wasn't the effort, it was the tool use. They don't like tool use just because it's difficult. They like something specifically about it. So it would appear that they are enjoying it. And this is directly related to something that we talk about all the time when we talk about having animals in zoos and aquariums and science museums in captive environments is enrichment, yeah. right? Is trying to get them to do natural behaviors that they would do in the wild. So it's not just food on a plate. It's getting them to, if they're a vulture, stick their head into a box with a small hole in it to get their food out. Or um, if they're uh, an animal that digs, putting it in something where they have to tear it apart to get to it, right? So this is enrichment. This is encouraging natural behaviors to get to the food, to make it harder so that it's um, it's not just, oh, I ate and I'm done and I'm bored. But this is a whole nother side of it. Maybe it's part of their mental health. Maybe it's part of their, um, their I mean, it's hard to say happiness or enjoyment, but 
something related to that. Maybe they're more content using their natural behaviors. It's pretty interesting. Right. It is yeah. interesting. I mean, this go, uh, this is, I, 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 I want to, I would love to know, you know, the, the impact or the, uh, how this works in species of different levels of intelligence. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, not with necessarily the tool use, but in terms of enrichment and mm -hmm. could we determine whether generalized enrichment makes animals generally more optimistic? About well, stuff. we know what? that it, it reduces stereotypical behaviors. It reduces pacing. It reduces um, over grooming. So we know from a lot of behavioral studies in captivity that um, that enrichment generally helps the mental health of those animals. So we right. know that. So then, yeah, the question is, do they enjoy it? Does it um, does it create contentment? Um or is it just giving them stuff to do so that they're not focused on, you know, being bored? <laughs> right. I mean, when when an animal has stuff to do, they're less likely to develop stereotypical beha behaviors like yeah. feather pro pulling or hair pulling or, you know, so they give themselves bald patches and, yeah. uh, you know, these yeah. terrible things that are similar to human mental disorders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they can... Animals can display symptoms of anxiety, of depression, Absolutely. of, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is, yeah, it's interesting. I still, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm, this is similar to a study that we talked about a month or two back, but this idea of optimism and yeah. pessimism in animals, I'm still not enjoying the word choice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it could, yeah, it could simply just be more curious would also yeah. be engagement yeah. engaged yeah more engaged yeah. yeah um exploratory there's lots of other words that you could use i agree that might be more descriptive of what they observed um one of the did i yes i didn't close it yet one of the quotes from the lead researcher that actually um i don't want to put anybody on blast here but um uh, it irked me a little bit um was that uh, quote, I think we tend to under anthropomorphize animals, especially oh. really intelligent animals. It's not that they are machines and we are feeling beings. Clearly, animals also have emotional reactions and moods. So, yes, animals have emotions. Yes, they have moods. But this idea that we under anthropomorphize animals, I spent a lot of time on this show arguing the exact opposite of that. Animals are not humans or no. wild animals are not humans. We are animals, but we are a different kind of animal. There are things that we think are unique to us that are not unique to us, but also imposing human experience onto a wild animal is very questionable. So I agree with Ooh. you. I think the terminology could be better, but what we're seeing is that there is a potential increase in mental health based on stimulation mental stimulation kind of thing. yeah so there's a, there's a change in affect for sure yeah. they're more they're more activated they're more they're more prone to continue the tasks that they're being given if they're in a, in a in a quick manner yeah, one, yeah of, but... one of my favorite studies that um, I learned about when I was a carnivore keeper, actually, was on fishing cats, these little cats from, I think they're from Southeast Asia, um, that are one of the only cats that can swim, and they'll jump down and, and fish, fish. And when you feed mm -hmm. them live fish in a zoo, um, if you feed them a live fish every single day, you would think, right? Like, this is a great experience for them. Give it to them every day if you can. It actually, their their behavior peaks for a couple weeks and then severely drops and they start to ignore the fish. If you feed them on a schedule, if you give them live fish every Monday, Lord. Wednesday, Friday, exact same thing, peaks and drops off. But if you feed them at randomly kind of selected days, their behavior peaks and stays up because they don't know when to anticipate the fish. So they will go swim and they will look for fish and there may or may not be fish in the pool. And that more directly replicates how things work in the wild, right? You don't always get food. Um, but I think that 
this is exactly the point, right? Is that it's, it's making them use their brain for what their brain is for. What has it evolved to do? And we're getting right. them to do that. To deal with surprises, to deal yeah. with the unexpected things that occur in the environment. Yes, that's what the brain is tuned for. And when everything is the same all the time, yeah, any animal might go a little batty. Yeah. Moving on from crows and puzzles, you know, uh, human diet, that's another puzzle that's always interesting. I'm fascinated with the idea of caloric restriction as a way to increase health and increase longevity. And there's a new method of caloric restriction that's called intermittent fasting. We've discussed it on the mm -hmm. show previously, where instead of just decreasing your calorie intake, you know, say by 25% every day all the time, uh, you just don't eat for one day out of seven or whatever schedule you uh, you end up subscribing to. And there are many different ways to, to choose uh, this intermittent fasting and how you will eat. A new study has just come out published in Cell Metabolism. Researchers have looked at the difference between just caloric restriction and alternate day fasting. And in this strict regimen, what you do is you fast for 36 hours and then you get to eat whatever you want for 12 hours, whatever you want, anything. And um, they found the two separate studies in this uh, one, they looked at 60 people over uh, six months and found that it was similar to what had been seen in uh, caloric restriction trials, where just that's just diet, right? You just mm -hmm. reduce your calories. They found that the that the people in this ADF, this alternate day fasting regimen, were able to actually stick to it better, and they had similar health benefits. And then they did a, another trial where they did a random uh, a random control where people were put either in the alternate day fasting randomly or in a control group for four weeks and they compared them directly and found that there were some very uh, definite increases in uh, in metabolic faster factors that were beneficial and they say that the um, what ends up happening with alternate day fasting is that people end up over time, eating less calories than they would have, fewer calories than they would have had they been only on caloric restriction. Because of the 36 hours of not eating, even though you can eat whatever you want in those 12 hours, most people do not replace all the calories that were lost from that 36 hours of fasting. And so uh, in all, they end up coming out below what would have been uh what would have what would have occurred with just dieting caloric restriction and people are supposed to be able to stick to it more easily i don't know if i would the idea of 36 hours of not eating is a little bit it's a little scary to me and doing that you know 36 hours diet 12 hours eat what i want and just doing that over and over and over and over again I don't. I don't know about. That. I like to. I like to. It fast. does. It does explain why poor people are always so healthy. <laughs> no. I mean, so I kind of do this uh, diet yeah. once in a while, just sort of accidentally. Like it's just, <laughs> You're gonna live forever. I push off meals, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know that it's. Uh, I know it's not for Blair. I'd lose friendships. <laughs> I, I might lose my job. <laughs> I get so angry. Yeah, when I don't eat, there's the low blood sugar factor that it's not so fun to be around, right? I would I would probably hurt somebody. It wouldn't go over very well. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, no. new ways of looking at dieting. We'll see if you would like. It's a new, it's a new thing. It works. People say it's really good. The science is good. Um, and this big news, really exciting. Um, researchers have remade computer chips 
just like they were in the 1980s, but not out of silicon, out of carbon nanotubes. This is the first time that engineers have actually created. This has been an idea for a long time. Researchers have been wanting to make chips, computer chips out of carbon nanotubes. But for various reasons, technical hurdles, they have been unable to do so until now. And the researchers now were able to create this carbon nanotube chip um, using, there's some neat methods involved. Anyway, we'll put a link on the website. I want to get through the story fairly quickly. But the exciting thing is not that it performs as well as a 1980s silicon chip, which was pretty slow. Computing back in the 80s wasn't much. But what is exciting is that we finally have gotten to this point. Silicon is reaching its limits. The silicon chip is at some point going to max out and we are going to exceed the energetic capacity, the amount of current that can flow between a gate, you know, between these in these circuits is going to be maxed out. We've gotten tinier and tinier and with more and more stuff packed in. Carbon nanotubes have the potential of going even stronger and with more computing power. So, but do, do we, how much more computing power do we really need? How much smaller do the give me all need the computing be? power, <laughs> all of it? <laughs> I mean, I, I want to stream to six different channels at once. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, yeah, for personal electronics, aren't we there? Just stop. But for for research purposes, I can see some fantastic benefits. For, well, for, I feel like I mean, there's for the... lots of personal stuff. There's all sorts of reasons why things should be smaller for um, for devices that will help us with our health. Little little robots that could be working inside our bodies to keep us healthy. The new pacemakers that would be tiny at almost cellular sized. You know, there are so many things. Neural implants. There are so many directions things could go with further miniaturization. Now, whether or not we want to go that way is another question. But the things that we can do or will be able to do will rely on having Large, pretty large amounts of current being able to flow through very tiny, tiny channels. Yeah. yeah. Justin, how hot is it? You're muted. You're muted now. Is it, has anybody else noticed the? Can oh you yeah. See this? Yeah, <laughs> the, it's me. I don't know why I'm. That's not on my end. Just so you know, that's there we go. Oh, oh yeah, that's me. There we go. That's even better. Uh oh yeah, yeah, uh, the story. It, it's getting hot in here, people. Uh, but not just uh, in the United States. It turns out global warming is having a an effect in Europe as well, which I know uh, we don't hear as much oh, about. Yeah. Global, you mean, not yeah. just United yeah. States warming. Well, you know, yeah. I think, you know, whenever they say global or like, you know, the world this league or the we're the world champion, it's usually just in the United States. Turns out, who knew global warming is happening everywhere? Uh, it's uh, this is increasing number of days of extreme heat, decreasing the number of days of extreme cold in Europe, according to a new study. So temperatures in Europe have hit record highs this summer passing 114.8 degrees Fahrenheit in southern France, which is 46 That's Celsius. insane. This research is, uh, is in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, and they find the number of summer days with extreme heat has tripled since 1950. Summers, therefore, obviously have become overall hotter. Number of winter days with extreme cold uh, decreased in frequency by half. So not as by as much, but still less extreme cold. Winters have become warmer uh, overall as well as so summers are getting warmer. Winters are getting warmer. A new study finds parts of Europe are warming faster than climate models had projected. Uh, this is Cody voice for Ruth Lorenz, climate scientist at Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. Uh, and the lead author of the new study, even at this regional scale over Europe, we can see that these trends are much larger than we would expect from a natural variability. 
That's really a signal from climate change. Uh, it says extreme hot days. Uh, there's three times more of them than there was in 1950. And they're 4.14 degrees Fahrenheit or 2.3 Celsius hotter. Cold days have warmed by 3 Celsius, 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit on the averages. Those are on the averages. Uh, the hottest days and coldest nights were even more than their uh, mean temperatures. So, yeah, it's uh, it's getting hot out there, people. And, it, it, yeah, it is turning out. I'm getting confirmation uh, from the looks that my co-hosts were giving me. Global warming is actually taking place uh, everywhere in the world. So. It is. That it is. Around the world. Global warming, the general term for anthropogenic climate change happening everywhere. Oh, Blair, you got another yes. story? Yes, it's actually related to climate change, so I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, migration, animal migration. Um, we've been studying it for a very long time. There's lots of question as to how the animals know where to go and when. Um, generally speaking, there are two camps of thought. One is that um, the animals use local cues within their vicinity to determine where to migrate. Um, and the second is that they develop a memory of the landscape where they live and then use that information to guide them. So either um, the good food's over there, let's go that way, or that's where grandma told me to go. So um, University of Wyoming has a new piece of research looking at mule deer, and they found that mule deer navigate in spring and fall, mostly by using their knowledge of past migration routes and seasonal ranges. So in this case, um, this means that landscape memory is strong within a population. And so a uh, loss of migratory population numbers will destroy the herd's collective mental map of where to go. Mm. So the idea is here that if there's a reduction in um, the population size, there's less collective knowledge of where to go for migration. So it's kind of stored in the population as a whole. Which way do we go? I think we should all go that way. Um, the other side to this is that um, there is an expectation as climate shifts or as habitats change from human impacts from deforestation and stuff like that, that animals will be able to figure out where to go next. Or that if one area usually gets rain, but another area got rain instead this year, they'll go over there because that's where the food is. But if they're moving based on a mental map within their population, they might not catch on. So the more we know about uh, what influences migration patterns, the better we can ant anticipate needs to guide them elsewhere um, or what may or may not happen as a result of moving targets. Because one of the biggest problems that climate change brings to migrating species is a um, less predictable timeline and location of food. Right. So. It's that predictability that mm -hmm. is... Yeah, I, I love the concept of the community mental map in yes. this situation. I have uh, I hadn't really considered that before, but there is there is each individual has their own memory and may have experiences that would be beneficial in one situation or not in another. But overall, in the population, they can all influence each other and end up. It's kind of that the the wisdom of the herd, like literally. Yep. <laughs> absolutely that's yeah. awesome that is awesome well i hope that the wisdom of the herd got you listening to twists in the first place i hope that the wisdom of the herd has kept you listening and that you enjoyed this episode We've come to the end of another episode and it is time for me to say thank you to all the people all you i'm saying thank you to you for watching you for listening. Thank you to Fada for helping with show notes and social media and our chat room. Gord McLeod, thank you for helping make that web chat free node chat room a good place to be. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And thank you to all our Patreon sponsors. I would like thank to say thank you now 
to those Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Paul Disney, Andrew Swanson, Richard Onimus, Greg Landon, Craig Landon, Ed, Andy Gross, Stu Pollock, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Mark Mazaros, Jack, Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill Kay, Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Eric Knapp, Richard Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Dan, Matt Bass, Darwin Hannon, Patrick Pecoraro, Ben Bignell, Jean Tellier, John Gridley, David Williams, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stephen Alberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Gerald Myshak, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Richard Porter, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zukrenarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, RDM, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Suzuki, Jim Drapo, Greg Briley, Sean, La Sean Lamb, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthan, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflow, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you all for your support on Patreon. And if you would like to support us on Patreon with a monthly donation, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience or just click the Patreon link on twist.org. And remember that you can help us out just by telling your friends about Twist. Get them to subscribe today. And on next week's show, we will be back yet again to talk about science news. We will be talking with a neuroethicist next week, talking about the ethics of various neuroscience policies in the and in in their uh, involvement in the legal realm so many things to talk about the future of the brain and humanity maha yes yes once again though 8 p.m pacific time at twist.org slash live you can find us there watch live join the chat room or you can watch later we're on YouTube. We also have our wonderful podcast, which you can find at twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Uh, however you found us, you can find us there again, or you can look for all of those other wonderful places. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. You know what it is. It's www.twist.org. While you're there, poke around, see what you can find, make comments on previous shows, start conversations with us, the hosts, or other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere, somewhere in your subject line. Otherwise, what will happen, Blair? You'll be... Spam filtered into oblivion. <laughs> you can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science at Dr. Kiki at Jackson Fly and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover, address a suggestion for an interview haiku that comes tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here again next week and we hope to join us again for more great science news. And if you have learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. Uh oh. <gasps> and this the music ended. Science. He's like, hard out. Boom, we're done. Transition to the next thing, which is just. Oh, the next no. thing. And she left us in pantomime. This week in science. <laughs> this week in science. There's nothing to. You're like drunk girl humming a song you've never properly listened to before. You know the song is like. This week in science. See, that's what it sounded like. Yeah.
This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming away. So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 This week in science This week in science This week in science 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got so how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. this week in science, 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 this week in science. Oh, wait, wait, no, I didn't do that. Did I do that? Wait, yeah. Oh, no, that doesn't work. Can I hide us? Let's stop screen. No, that doesn't hide us. I have to go like, I have to remove us from the stream. That didn't work. I need to make a bigger overlay. I gotta make a bigger overlay, everybody. You made it to the after show. We made it to the after show. You can hear me now, right? <laughs> So my computer decided to glitch out on the audio again. I don't know what is going on there. Our tech Everything. is falling apart. Our tech is falling. We've got the psh noise from Justin. You just have computers that are they're performing okay. but Yeah, yeah I just couldn't do multiple things at once. Which yeah. Sucks. Like I went to type into the chat room at one point and my whole... Like couldn't I couldn't do anything. It's just too much for this little machine. It's like yeah. it can it can stream, but that's it. <sighs> yeah. And then let's see, Hot Rod is suggesting we should buy a three pack of laptop laptops to try and get a good deal. Oh yeah. <laughs> Everybody gets an you get a new computer. You get a new computer. Oh my goodness. Um I know the newfangled tech is failing us, right? What is this? New well, my laptop is, I mean, this Chromebook for sure, but my actual laptop that's failing me is from 2011. Mm -hmm. So it did great. It did great. It, it did, did great. really great go, making it all the way to 2019. Yeah. I'm proud great. of it. Congratulations laptop he he deserves a retirement <laughs> yeah uh what was i going to say what was i going to say anyway i like the um i i like the stream yard setup here there are a few things i wish were better but for a relatively inexpensive thing is pretty good. I can, uh, I can. Oh, that's why we have our logo in the corner. You're paying now. They, uh, they actually did a thing. They're doing a short-term thing where I can try out 
for a week the uh, the upgraded service. Okay. I did That's notice, awesome. Yeah, I did, so, I the logo and I also noticed that uh, is there more? Really so we got we we got we got. I'm space. not Blair. I don't know what you're not. Becky. Oh, there <laughs> Lower thirds. Um, and then I this oh. I'm gonna make into a bigger we need a bigger overlay for the whole i need overlay for the whole screen so i can hide us oh oh yeah, yeah. you know that i can just hide us completely okay. um, i just did something totally ridiculous did you did you yeah. make just... i went i went like I, I stretched my arms out to see if i could get out <laughs> beyond it into your screens <laughs> which makes absolutely no sense it makes no it, sense <laughs> Um, but then there's this neat feature that I heard that we can do. So watch this. Uh, I don't think Wayne Donne is in the YouTube chat anymore. Mm -hmm. But we can put YouTube chat comments. Interesting. Oh, that's here. cool. Yeah. I wasn't muted, Fada. It was my audio glitch. I don't know what's going on. I thought it was a driver. I don't know what that's it is. might be a, a buffer. Really cool. Yeah, that's like very that. neat. Yeah. So what we, I mean, if I can figure out how to get it from the web chat, that would be awesome. But if people want to ask questions or something, they could put it in the YouTube chat and mm. um, and then we could put up very cool put up people's put up people's questions put up their comments yeah so that that's kind of cool that's a feature that's kind of neat um and then there are these like if i have we can do banners they have banners they put across um like i could have a banner that says become a patron on patreon you know that kind of thing like a mm, call to action yeah kind of with a with a link or something yeah nice yeah or a telephone number <laughs> you know what you know what i would love uh, yeah a telephone number uh, yes my email address no <laughs> i have I, this is this is a next level thing we're not there yet but what i would love to do uh would be to create like the news crawl at the bottom that are just titles of stories that published this week. Oh, that's fun. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> just like, you'd be yeah. like, oh, oh yeah. wait, there's a study on. Oh, wait, hang on. I'm Let's gonna go talk I'm gonna, about that one. Yeah, I'm gonna go grab that one. That like I had no idea that came out. I totally missed it. Ah. I'm gonna go grab that one. <laughs> or people just watching might go, Oh, oh that's no. an interesting title, and then just go Google it and find the study. That would be a blast. Yeah. Next, next well, level. even just the headlines that we're talking about might be a cool thing to have up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being able to put the headlines up ahead of time. Like, there are various things that could happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Fadakit says he could put people's questions in the YouTube chat room, maybe. That could be good. Yeah, but I'm liking this stream yard. So I would love to say thank you to patrons who have increased their monthly giving because i think that we will be buttons we will be purchasing this on the monthly because so far the videos everyone i saw people saying the video is looking better than just what it used to be with youtube's hangouts so this is good yeah um and then we just sounds need to work. better i'm not paying that much i mean i don't know if i'm a good um, judge, but I think the sound is better. I can hear more of the music. You can hear more of the music. Huh? I hear instruments I never heard before in the opening song. Well, What's that's because it's it's, it's been remade. So, uh, yeah, oh. I need to I need to tell this story. Uh, I thought yeah, I but... thought there was just there was like a bass line I was missing this whole time. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I I had the same initial reaction, like. Wow, I don't remember. Oh, this is new. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so but I do think actually in general the sound is better too. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would now I want to hear the story yeah. of the remix. Yes. Oh, Fado is saying he could put the together the scroll crawl in the lower third with the week's top science stories. I love it. Really? That could be interesting. I love it. I don't know. Uh, we'll see how that uh, would work. I, mean, I don't want Justin to get moment. distracted. 
it would distract me for sure. Yeah. And if I was a viewer, it would distract me from what I was listening to. Like that always happens to me on the new shows. I like get, I start reading what's on the bottom and I'm like, oh, I stopped listening to what they were saying. Yeah. I like the idea though of having a, uh, if I made little things to say what stories we're talking about Mm -hmm. while we're talking about them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Link to the, well, or uh, where the study, name of the study and where it's out of might be enough for people. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah but we could see we could see how to do that yeah um and then but the 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 song the theme song alessandro alex troiano who made the song he emailed me the end of july and said i just checked into the latest episode and noticed you're using the original draft of the twist theme song i made for the show i've since remastered it with drums if you're interested in a refreshed version Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So he said, feel free to use it. He said, it's so hard to believe I made this nearly 10 years ago. Life has changed so much since then. Hope all is going well. Things are going great. Yeah, we put we put a lot of miles on that song. (laughs) We have. It's so great. Yes, sound is good, not counting the clicks and accidental mutes. Yes, exactly. You noticed that, did you? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the accidental mutes. What? Yeah, the sound is more balanced, says Noodles. Great. So overall, I think StreamYard is a this is a good solution for us. This is great. Woo woo. Um, and who knows? I'll keep digging into it. And if other people dig into it and find cool things having to do with it and want to let me know, that's awesome. But I'll try to keep learning it's hard to keep up it's hard to keep up with all the technology i try all the science and the technology it's a lot it's a lot um let's see so let's see hot rods talking about hp business desktops um yeah i don't know we i think blair would like a mac because she's not a pc person yeah, I use them at work, but for what I would be trying to do to grow or twist stuff, it would be much easier for me to do it on a Mac. Um, right. And I think, um, yeah, we're we're looking, we'd, we'd like to get an i7, uh, probably 16, um, 16 gigabytes of or it's not 16 megs of RAM, not gigabytes, <laughs> sorry, 16 megs mm-hmm. of RAM. Mm. Um, and yeah, a pretty, pretty big drive, but it'd be a laptop. And yeah, <laughs> no Linux. Thanks, Thunder Beaver. 16 gigabytes of RAM. I don't know. The 16 one, it's better. The 16 one. <laughs> The 16 one. Also, I'm so tired. You guys, I've been like holding on by a thread for the last half of the show. I'm like, science, tell story, kick buttons, kick buttons. No, hit buttons. The talk, kick, talk smart, and ask questions. What? Okay. Yeah. The other thing is, ideally, I, I really want the bigger screen because I have three windows open while I'm doing twists. And right now, for example, on the Chromebook tonight, mm-hmm. it's on an 11 inch screen. <sighs> too tiny. I always have a freak out when I have to go back to my laptop, which is a pretty decent sized laptop. So well, and this now that I two use inches smaller screen. than my MacBook that died, but I want the 15 and a half size one so that I can at least have a little bit more breathing room. I don't know what I've got. Hang on. I got a pretty big screen. I'm going to go ahead and measure it. Yeah. Yeah. Eric Part and AK. Is, yeah. I don't have a desk. You don't have a desk, right? I have a Bay Area apartment. Good night, Fada. Uh, yeah. Laptops are great for that. And there's a lot you can do with laptops these days. So um, Identity4 was also asking if Justin had done any more testing on the uh on the audio and 
we did an accidental test of the audio right before the show. And it was part of the reason we were a little bit late. Justin came in and uh, we realized that the noise was still in there. And, um, and then we realized that his mixer was turned off and his mic was, so it was not, there's no mic input. It was coming that this particular before the show, it was still pshting when the camera mic was picking up his audio. So we now know it is something that is not, not related the to the mix or the mixer, yeah. not the mic or the mixer. Yep. So it is computer. It is the computer somewhere in there. So it could be the uh, sound card. BIOS, said Noodles. What? I don't know. BIOS. Um, yeah, yeah it's, the problem is in your biology, Justin. That's what he's I know. Doing. Identity 4, we are getting closer to the <laughs> answer here, right? Yeah, the clickety bit did happen a little bit. But Justin, you were really good about writing the, the mute button. I yeah. appreciated that. Yeah, so it may be I set off a small uh, electronic pulse every once in a while from my brain. I think that's what it is, yes. Form of echolocation. <laughs> uh, I'm searching for information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so uh, I have a 32 inch screen uh, that I'm using, <laughs> utilize, like a 32 inch widescreen kind of a thing, uh, which is plenty of room to get the pictures up and throw the story up. I have actually a small monitor down here too that I used to use to monitor the show, but for some reason, uh, it seemed as though when the second screen was connected, it created these weird uh, lag issues. No. Oh. Um, yeah. I shouldn't I have, do that. So uh, everything fits on the really big screen, and so it's all fine. <laughs> right? Did you say, <laughs> did you pose for the picture, Blair? I sure did. I did. <laughs> Obviously, taking, taking a little picture of my setup here, my screen. Am I, I in I can, it? Let's see if it'll go backwards. Here, can I show you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're in there. Nice. There you are. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I've got my big screen. I think it's a, what is that 40 inch? I don't know. It's a nice big screen. It is nice. Mm -hmm. And I have one window, two windows, three. <laughs> Ah, Four. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> One window. <laughs> so many windows. Yeah, and I don't, yeah, I think right now there isn't as, there's no muting right now. There's no, or there's no ing right now. And I don't know why. Yeah, it hasn't done it for a little while. So I don't know what it is that well, makes Justin's it happen. Well, Justin's also not talking right now. <laughs> yeah, but, but I'm it, not muted. It's but it so it's uh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe if I because huh. I don't know that it was happening. Was it just happening when I was talking? Was that part? No, of it? I don't it's, know. it's when other people. It, it was it was oh, doing okay. just a bunch. I wonder if there's some kind of mouse click or window no. open or I don't have any weird window opening thing mm. that doesn't seem associated with the mouse I have no idea I don't even have a guess <laughs> my guess is the sound card but that's my guess. Yeah. Now that how I'm, much is I, a sound card? But maybe it's an audio driver still. I mean, but God, so, so I maybe never, you need to update your BIOS. I've never updated my biology. Yes. I don't know. Uh, there's things. 
<laughs> you don't want to do the things. I don't really like to hang out with my Like, kids. there's, so I was originally like, oh, well, what if he just brought a video into like a PC repair place and they would recognize it immediately? Except that we have so many smart people in our chat rooms and they don't yeah. know what it is. I feel like if it was something that was and obvious, they would like, oh, they'd be yeah. like, oh, I know exactly what that is. Oh yeah, our smarty audience would be like, we know they they would be all yeah. over it. They would know the sound mm -hmm. and they would be able to tell. Us. So whatever it is, it's something weird. Yep. Justin, just throw the whole computer <laughs> away. All right. <sighs> Sounds like a plan. BIOS update. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, I don't know why Google doesn't understand what I'm looking for when I say weird psh sound randomly coming from computer. Yeah. Oh, there's talking. There's talking. Um, let's see. What do we need to discuss? Because I need to go to sleep. I'm tired. Um 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 Blair has sent me the cover art for the Animal Corner calendar. Yeah, I, I can show you what I'm working with here. Yeah, so I will soon be putting it on the website uh, for uh, looking. So we will have... start telling people the calendar is coming soon. Um we are considering doing a special promotion with Patreon, with our Patreon account to, uh, with the calendar. Maybe. Here, check it out. Sorry. So here's, here's this. Okay. That's here's pretty cool. There it, was. Well, there it is. What did you just do, Justin? Nothing. You're just, sit you're just sitting, sitting there. This. Okay. Look at this. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so cool. I am for the first time ever introducing computers <laughs> into my work. So I am like, I am creating color blocking according to my hand free drawn situation. And then here's the really cool Great. thing. For as perhaps as part of that special promotion thing, here we go. We have. I'm very excited about this stained glass. Oh, interesting! So I'm, I'm printing onto acetate. Yeah, some transparency, like old school transparencies, like from yeah. school. I had to a uh, special order from Amazon. Um. But so this is something that you could hang in your window yeah. and have actual stained glass. Because that was like the thing that was really bugging me was that it was so much like stained glass, but it wasn't. It wasn't actually going to be usable like that. So um, the calendar will have, you know, these vibrant colors, which is great. But then, yeah, the originals will be in available as an actual stained glass. That's cool. There you go. Mm -hmm. That'll be super fun. Yeah. Actually like here. Now you can kind of see when it's shiny, it'll it'll really like I feel like I have to it needs to be like backlit. Yeah. Yeah, you need a light behind yeah. it. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> not quite the like kind of. There you go. It really needs a sun. But anyway. That's where we're at. But so we have a cover. So here, that's what you awesome. wanted to see was the cover. That's what you've said. And then I Yeah, you we have a cover. Because um, the printer ate the cover that I was working on. Oh, no. So, um, oh no, I don't, no, no, no. The original's fine. 
It's just the transparency. I, I have to go print it at Kinko's or something. But um, the actual is <laughs> like, like nom, 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 nom. this. This is okay. Good. Okay. Which is the good. Important thing. That's the thing. That That's took, the like, important part. Okay. Yeah. So here we go. Just have to line it up. Ish. There we go. Yeah. Let me get. Let me. There you are. Right there. We got yeah. our cover. What? What? Good. That's good. Yeah. So there we go. Don't nice don't mind cover. the noise. My shift worker just left. <laughs> Goodbye, shift worker. We're finding molecules to make you God, healthier. I, know. I keep telling him like you have to exercise and eat well because I already know the science is telling oh, me you're gonna oh, die oh. way before me. Is doesn't he isn't he on like an 18 hour, 20 hour day right now or something? Yeah, because he's also in school. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So that's especially good. Although he can definitely last on way less sleep than I can. Yeah. Because he'll, mm -hmm. yeah. For example, for today, uh, last night he worked 11 to 7 30, came home, didn't go straight to bed, had breakfast with me, took a shower. 7 30 in the morning. Yes. 11 p.m., 7 30 a.m. Yes. Had breakfast with me, took a shower, went to bed. Oh. Woke up at 10 15 a.m. So he slept an hour and 45 minutes, maybe. Um, and then went to school <laughs> until 3 30. <laughs> and then came home <laughs> and slept from four to six. <laughs> Woke up again to eat dinner with me. <laughs> went to sleep at eight. <laughs> and then just woke up at 10 15. And left for work. And is going to work. Wow. So. That's not good. I, I mean, it's, it's on sleeping. Tuesdays and Thursdays, he can sleep from like uh, 8.45 a.m. until usually sleeps until like 3.30 or 4 o'clock, which still is not eight hours. But that's his, that's his shedge. schedule this schedule but, but i mean this is all to become a nurse and then once he's a nurse you know his schedule will be different he'll work like 12 hour shifts but only three or four days a week and it'll be, it'll be a whole different thing oh identity four found a cool mixer huh alesis i like a fx mixer <laughs> oh ed's saying it's me the clicking's not me we definitely <laughs> pulled that out I don't know what happened. I mean, like, see, it was all super clicky for a while, and now it's nothing. It's like the most random. It, I can't figure out. It's definitely not me. Like we, I was muted, and it was still happening back. And right, we did the muting of everyone, and it like was still I was happening. Doing all right? this, and it wasn't. Plus, this is a different computer. <laughs> I've it never is. used this computer for twist, so it's uh, definitely it, not me. But it, it never does it when I mute it, is the thing. Yeah. yeah. So that's 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 good enough. All right, Blair. Yeah. 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 Everyone, it's very exciting. Keep thinking about what we should be doing for our 2020. 20 year anniversary mm. and i'm going to start looking at dates on calendars and figure out whether we should do it next june round our 20th anniversary or if we should like do a combo with our 800th podcast episode because that's gonna happen maybe end of next year is that happening or is that happening 2021 anyway i have to count these things out i what must do the this? calculating 736 so uh, there's 52 weeks in a year. Maybe at the beginning of 2021, that is our. Yeah, I think 800. so. Because, yeah, so oh. this is August. It's almost September. So next September, you said 730. What is this? Six. Six. So then that'll be 780. 
eight Mm -hmm. this same time next year. So it would be another 12 weeks, three months. So it would probably be December. I still have to calculate. It might be. But we could do a December. Yeah, we'll have to calculate it. We have to figure it out. Did we decide already? I'm sure we did. I'm sure it's on the calendar. But we're are we not doing Christmas and New Year's shows because they're both Wednesdays? I forget what we decided. It's definitely on the calendar. It's on the calendar. You should look at the but calendar. I, my calendar's so far. <laughs> I, know. I could go look and come back, but I, I want to upstairs. Okay, we're gonna look all around. All around. I don't know. Oh. Little big. I don't need to know that right now. Oh, she's gonna go look. Okay. You're gonna blame me? Whatever. Hot rod. Yeah. Fine. Oh, I know. Twistmas is always fun. I think we will be doing shows. I can't imagine that we'll be taking two weeks off. Are we taking two weeks off of Twist at the holidays? I have. I have the answer. Our year in review is the Wednesday before Christmas. On Christmas, we decided we're taking that week off. The following week, New Year's Day is a Wednesday, which means we could potentially do the show on New Year's Day. It's not like trying to do it on New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. Or we could do it on the 2nd. But because it's a new calendar, we didn't decide yet. (laughs) We're like, let's push that decision off a ways. (laughs) But this is what I do know. We are not doing a Christmas week episode is what we had decided. That's what it says on the calendar. Which I think is fine. Everyone has other fine. stuff to be doing anyway. It is fine. Yes. Um, you know, unless we decided we wanted to do an episode in there and then we can mm-hmm. record it on a different day. Mm-hmm. 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 And release that on New Year's Day. Who knows? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. cool, cool, cool. Why would we be doing a show on New Year's Day? I mean, we could. I don't know. Some people do family stuff. On New Year's Day? Yeah. You do family stuff? I don't know. Because you have have the day off work and school. I don't know. Some people do stuff. I do friend things. And this year, by no, looking at the calendar, my it's like great because my son's school is going to be out until like the following week. So I, th- um, I would be super on board with um, no live show <clears throat> and doing a record in the middle of a day when none of us are working because of a holiday, and then airing it later or something like that. I don't know. That's something that I would potentially be open to that week. I think. Everyone will understand. Chat room, feel free to chime in and be like, no! <laughs> but I think I think everyone would understand if we released a show on New Year's Day, but it had been previously recorded this once. I think it would be fine. Got to listen to the chat room and see what the chat room says. Good night, Eric in Alaska. Uh, last show of the year, the twist anniversary show. Yeah. The other people don't care. <laughs> Hot Rod says we all need to be enjoying champagne for the New Year's Day show. We could do that. We could do that for sure. Our prediction show. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be pretty fun, actually. Champagne and predictions. Yes. I mean, we could also do a no science news shorty show on New Year's Day that is just predictions. Uh huh. We could do that also. You know what the great thing is? We can do what we want. Yeah. And it's not on the <laughs> calendar yet. So we can really do whatever we want. We just have to decide right. before I publish the calendar. But we don't have to des- uh, decide tonight. Say no. good night, no. Blair. Good night, Blair. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. Good night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night. Good night, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Have a wonderful weekend. Have uh, just sciencey time. Whatever you're doing, get some sciencey sleep. 
whether you're a short sleeper, a regular sleeper, a long sleeper, a night owl, or an early bird. Sleep's still good for us all. We're going to go do that right now here in the Pacific Coast time. We'll see you next Wednesday. I hope that you will join us for our show and interview next week. It's going to be tons of fun. I'm ending the broadcast now. Over and out. Good night. I'm going to hit the button again. <laughs>